people said, amen. Please have a seat and open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. We were in Isaiah last week. We're going to be in Isaiah again this week. And we're going to be, we're in our second week in this series on experiencing God. And this week's uh, message is called Looking to God. And I'm going to jump right to the question. The question is pretty simple. Why, do, why should we look to God? Seems like a simple question. And the short answer is because he's God. And we should shut our Bibles and say, let's pray and let's go home. And maybe some of you are going, I wish he would just do that just one time. But the reality is, I think sometimes because the answer seems so obvious, we miss the powerful details in the obvious. And so um, this passage in Isaiah is going to show us at least five reasons that we should look to God. There's a lot more, but these are the five that I saw in this passage. So in Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah's to the right, just to the right of the Psalms, Proverbs. Um, it's a big book. I remember Isaiah was a prophet of the kingdom of Israel around 700 BC. It was during a time that the kingdom had divided and um, God's people had grown cold to the things of God. And God used Isaiah and eventually King Hezekiah to turn the people's hearts back to God for a season. But we're in the season where they're not quite there yet. And so we're going to look at the first of our five reasons. And the first is because his provision is all satisfying. If you look at Isaiah 55 and verse 1, it starts with ho. Some of your translations don't even have a word there. If they do, it might be a word like ah. It's A-A-H. It's, it's an exclamation of sorrow. It's not like, hey, pay attention. It's like, ah. God is like, he's like almost screaming at them, wake up. And that's how it starts. And he says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters who have no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine with milk with, and milk without money and without cost. Guys, what does that sound like? Come to the waters that, have, that you have no money. Buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk. What, who does that sound like? Doesn't it sound like Jesus? At the, it, it, we're not going to turn there, but at the very last page of your Bible, it may not be physically in your, the last page of your Bible, because you might have maps or something, but the, in Revelation chapter 22, the last words God revealed to us in His spoken word, the last words Jesus says, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, He says this, He says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears, Come. And let the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who wishes, to take the water of life without cost. Doesn't that sound a lot like what God was saying through Isaiah 700 years before Jesus even came? Look at verse 2 of Isaiah 55. He says, why do you spend money on what is not bread? That word bread there really means nourishment. And he's saying, he's saying why, God is saying to them, why are you spending your money on stuff that is not nourishing, that is not going to build you up? that is not going to strengthen you. And then he says, and your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Guys, okay, we spend so much of our time, I spend so much of my time, we spend so much of our time seeking fulfillment in things that will not satisfy. We just do. I, last week I did my little analogy, I'm gonna, or my little demonstration, and I know all analogies kind of break down at some point, but this week, because um, some of you that were sitting here and saw the mess that I made, you'd never heard another word I said after that. I brought a bucket this time to hopefully collect some of my mess, but you remember, here's my little bottle that represents me, right? And, and so this is my, this, that's supposed to be me, according to Abby, my middle daughter, and, and so I'm sitting here, and I'm empty, and I'm dry, and I talked about how last week we're running around, and God is trying to fill us up. But here's the thing, there's even a step beyond just me being empty and not sitting still like I talked about last week and letting myself be filled with Him through the power of His Spirit. But the problem is, and according to what Isaiah says, is that we tend to fill ourselves up with things that do not satisfy. So I have here, so this is the world. There's a picture of the world there for those of you who can see it. And this is, this is the stuff of the world, is what's represented in this bottle. And guys, some of the stuff in the world is not bad. Right? I mean, God created the world, and there's, there's a lot of beauty. Even in the broken creation, there's a lot of beauty. Things like marriage that God created is beautiful and good. Things like family that God calls us to be a part of and, to, and to, to go and multiply. Those things are good things. But even the good things that are in the world can become bad things when they become the thing. And then there's also just a lot of brokenness and a lot of, frankly, just evil Right? Who is the ruler of this world? 
I know God is sovereign over it, but who, is, who does the Bible say is the ruler of this mess? Satan is. And what he is trying to do to us is he is trying to get us, and so I'm going to try to fill this up without making too, maybe I'll do it over here. I'm going to try, and, and so I will spend time being distracted by so many things. Like I, I will, you know, guys, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Let's be real and transparent. Pornography is chewing men up, even in the church. Why? Because God created intimacy, and Satan has polluted it. And so we start, we start looking, but we go, oh, this is going to satisfy me. And so we start looking to things like that. We start looking to things like my career. Wait a minute, money. Having he who dies with the most toys wins. And so I'm going to pursue that. I'm going to fill myself up because that's going to satisfy me. And I go, okay, that's not working. But you know what? I, I, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. I don't have those big sins. But what I am doing is I'm going, you know what? I just, my marriage, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on my marriage and that's all I'm going to do. Or my family and we're just going to kind of hunker down and we're going to hang out and we're going to wait for Jesus to come back because my marriage and my family are all that really matters in the world. And, and what we find out is even that doesn't satisfy us. And then maybe if we're lucky, we leave a little bit of space for Jesus Christ. And here's, here's, my, here's my Jesus right here, right? This is the, the fountain of living water. And maybe we hope that, well, okay, on Sunday mornings, I come to church on Sunday. So why are you lecturing me, Doug? Because on Sunday, I got a little bit of Jesus in me, right? So, or maybe I go, okay, but, but I, you know what? I'm trying to do this experiencing God study that we're doing, or I'm doing the daily reading. So why are you getting on me? Because I'm trying to get a little Jesus in me. But here's the problem. All it's doing is diluting. I mean, yeah, is it better than no Jesus in you? Sure, but it's, it's all, is it making much of a difference? And I can keep pouring and pouring and pouring but, and just making a bigger and bigger mess. But the truth is, guys, until we recognize that this is the only thing that satisfies and we get rid of all... This is what we talked about last week. In repentance... This is repentance right here. In repentance and rest, you are saved, he says. Guys, this is why things like confession in our prayer life is so important. This is why we desire so badly to be a body that is, not, that is not afraid to say, even up front, and you've heard the leaders of this church, not just this one, but many of us come up here and say, I struggle. Why? Because until we get to a place of, I need to decrease, I need to be emptied, how do I, and I probably can't do this all at one time over the bucket, but that's okay, how do I really have that abide, this is my Holy Spirit, for those of you that weren't here last week, remember the Holy Spirit, how do I really abide from that picture, the abiding, the connection, stay connected to Christ through His Holy Spirit in me so that He will fill me up. Because guys, think about, I'm not going to refill the bottle with, with the world stuff, but here's, here's what Jesus said. We read about this this week in our daily reading in Mark chapter 8. I think it was verse 36. He says, what does it, what does it, how does he say it? What does it satisfy, what is it, what good is it to a man to gain the whole world? And forfeit his soul. Guys, if this bottle, if, if, if I'm just full of worldly stuff, because that's what I've pursued, and not even, the, not even quote unquote the bad stuff, but just God, not God's stuff, not what God would have me do for his glory, what good is that? Jesus is saying, guys, if, if you are so busy pursuing the world, even in ways you think are good, without giving it a thought to how is it glorifying God, He's saying, you are forfeiting your soul. But Jesus also said, he didn't leave us there, praise God. He also said, he's the same guy that said, come to me, all who are thirsty. Right? He said, come to me, I am the fountain of living water. He said, take my, I'm going to lose my grip on this thing here. So take my, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble of spirit. And then he says, and you will find rest for your soul. So the question is, for me, and back to my little analogy, is which, which bottle, and I should have probably had two of them up here, which bottle best describes my life? Am I, am I filled up or too filled up with the world stuff just hoping, what, what Isaiah tells us, why, why do you spend your money on, on things that are not nourishing? Why do you try to eat things that do not satisfy you? Not just food. How are we spending our time, our talent, our treasure? Or am I really being filled 
to overflowing with the Spirit of the living God that we just sang about? Is He defining me? Or am I trying to define Him? Guys, here's, here's the question I would ask just as we wrap up this first point. Do you see His call to come to Him, all who are weary and heavy laden? Do you really see it as a blessing? Do you really see it as not as a burden? Okay, I, you know, I got to pick up my cross and deny myself and follow him. And oh, yeah, here we go. Right? That's so often the case, and it's sometimes the case in my life. And yet, there is nothing that will satisfy like Jesus Christ. And for those of us that know that, and when we're in those good places and we're walking along with him in a right way, we know that. But we've got to encourage, like Jeff admonished us or encouraged us a little bit in the invocation time, we've got to encourage one another in that because the world is going to scream a message that is counter this. The world is going to say, fill yourself up with me and you will be happy. And it's a lie. And it's a lie literally from the pit of hell. So, today's question, why should we look to God? One, His provision is all satisfying. It is the only thing that will fully satisfy us. The second thing is, His plans are unchanging and His will is unfolding. So it's kind of a two-part thing that we look at in the next three verses. So look at Isaiah 55, 3. He says, Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make, you an everlasting co- I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. And I stop and I go, wait a second. Uh, Isaiah, 700 years before Christ. Da- what, what, is it, what is that about? Who is this? What are these, uh, according to these faithful mercies shown to David? Well, right before, in, in Revelation 22, 17, that I quoted a minute ago, about come to me, all who are thirsty, the Spirit and the bride say come. The verse before that, in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root of and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So, okay, wait a minute. What does that mean about anything? Here's what that means, guys. That, all, all that is indicating, all that Jesus is indicating in Revelation 22, verse 16, and all that Isaiah is telling us here, or God is telling us through Isaiah when he says, according to the faithful mercies of David, is he is saying, God has had a plan of redemption since before the fall, frankly. Since the fall. And he is in the process like a map. To him, it's all done. His will is unchanging. He is going to restore everything. He just is. And he is God and it will happen. But from our perspective, it is like this multi-faceted map that is being unfolded for us. And, And David was a piece of that unfolding. It is from Adam to Abraham through David to Christ. That's why those genealogies that are listed in Matthew chapter 1, you know, the birth of Christ was this, in Luke chapter 3, those aren't just a list of names that we wonder why they're there. God put them there because here's what he's showing us. This was my unfolding plan. I am so in charge that I was able to fulfill the promise I made all the way back in Genesis 3, through Abraham in Genesis 12, through David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which you're going to read this week as part of your daily reading, he is saying, guys, you can trust me because I, my plan will not change and it will not be stopped. But you are on a need-to-know basis is what God is saying to us. Look at verse 4. Behold, I have made him, that's David, a witness to the peoples. Here's the funny part. David had already been dead 300 years by the time Isaiah wrote that. That's, that's longer than we've been a nation. So we, that's part of our problem in seeing God's will. Last week, God's, your life and God's will, right? Part of our problem is, man, we like, I, I don't see it today, so there must be no plan. God is saying, 300 years before this guy David lived, and I have made him a witness to the peoples. 300 years later, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you, because the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. I like how the New Living Translation kind of captures the thoughts of these three verses. So let me read it. It says, Come to me with your eyes. This is God speaking. Come to me with your eyes wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you an, all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the peoples? I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations 
you do not know, and peoples unknown to you will come running to obey, because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has made you glorious. Guys, this is, this is why I was describing why it's like even the good things in my bottle can become bad things when they take the place of the thing. Guys, this is why the huddle up mentality is so dangerous. Right, this idea that I'm just going to hunker down with me and my wife, or I'm just going to hunker down with me and my family, and I don't care what's going on in the kingdom, and I don't care what's going on in the bride of Christ. That is so dangerous. Here's why. Because God won't bless that. He just won't. The first time Carrie and I went through the Experiencing God study, we'd been married less than a year. We were meeting with a, it was a group of, of, of um, four, four couples that were all coaches and, and teachers in the Peoria School District, and we started meeting. We're like, we're going to go through the, the Experiencing God study. Not because of that study, although it was a great study 20 years ago, just like it is today, but through, through that series at that time, we were growing so much. And we did other studies as well, but even with our busy schedules that we all had, because we were all coaches and, and teachers, and God always worked it out where one night a week, we always had the same night off, and we could keep meeting. And then one day, we talked, after a couple years of this, we talked, and we said, somebody said, you know, we have been so blessed by this, shouldn't we share this with other people, co-workers. And, and, the, and the conversation was had, and what landed on this was, but we don't, I remember it like it was yesterday, but we don't want to lose this, so let's not. And the minute we said that, it was like God was like, I'm, I'm done with this. Because, and, and, all, and within weeks of that time, we stopped meeting as a group. Why? Because God was saying, guys, I didn't bless you just so you could sit here and be blessed. I blessed you. I'm blessing your marriage. I'm blessing your family. I'm blessing the church so that you can give me glory. That's it. And if you're not going to give me glory in your life, I'm going to stop blessing you. We have an opportunity as a body of Christ to not just have individual connections, but a corporate witness as well. Guys, together, the body of Christ fits together, and, and, we, and, and that's getting lost in some of this sort of new way of, of doing church, and, and, and not that it's all bad or not, but guys, there is, a, there is a collective witness that we cannot have just huddle up in our home or just hanging out with two or three other couples because there's a beauty to the body of Christ. And, and part of why... Part of why there's sort of this movement away from this corporate gathering is because, I mean, there's lots of reasons, and some of them are not bad, but, but part of it is because the enemy has gotten us to believe this, that people will not come to church. That is a lie. It is a lie from the pit of hell. Guys, the truth is, the truth is that surveys are done, and 80% of unchurched people would come to church if, would like to come to church if, Someone they had come to know and trust had their best interest at heart invited them and came with them. Here's, here's why that matters. Next week we have our fellowship meal. Just as, just as an example, next week is our first Sunday fellowship. There is an opportunity for us in those moments when those people come to have a corporate witness of the one another's that we cannot possibly have just having them over for dinner. Is that a good thing? Absolutely it is to have your unchurched neighbor, friend, coworker over to your house. But there is also great opportunity there to invite them into a corporate witness as well that is so much stronger than just being apart. I'm not going to have you turn there, but if you need proof of that, I was going to have you turn there. But I'm, I, Acts 2, 42 through 47, just write it down. You can read it later. It talks about that very thing that I just said. That they, that they broke bread together, they met in houses, and they gathered together in the temple, and they had all things in common. And then it says, and they, the, all the people around them were in awe of what God was doing in their midst. And then the last and most important thing is, and the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those that were being saved. We get the beauty, guys. We get the joy. We get the blessing of being part of his story. The question is, do we see it as a blessing? Okay, so why should we look to God? First, because his provision is all satisfying. Second, because his plans are unchanging and his will unfolding. The third is his forgiveness is unending. Look at Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Guys, this is a call to repentance, but not just unto salvation. Look at what he says. Right, look, at, look at what he's saying. He's saying, 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then he says in, in the middle of verse 7, and let him return to the Lord. Well, who's he talking to? He's talking to people who have come to Christ and, and gotten distracted by the things of the world. Who have put their hands on the plow and are looking all over the place at everything but Jesus Christ. And he's saying, return to me. Don't run from him, guys. Don't hide from him. Some of you are sitting here right now and you're going, yeah, but Doug, you don't know the sin issues that are going on in my life right now. None of them are too big for him to solve. Guys, none of them are too big for him to overcome. If you're waiting to get yourself cleaned up enough so that you can glorify him, you will not. It, it just won't happen. You will, when you step out and start glorifying him, he will clean you up. I loved in week one of the, of the study, Blackaby says this in the workbook. It says, when you believe that nothing significant can happen through you, you have said more about your belief in God than you have declared about yourself. I'll read it again. When you believe that nothing significant can happen through you, you have declared more about your belief in God than you have declared about yourself. That's why we got to preach a big God. That's why we got to believe in a big God, because He is a big God. Last week, if you want to turn back there, look at Isaiah, go back to just a few chapters to Isaiah 30, verse 15. It's where we were last week. Isaiah 30, 15. He says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. And we talked about what those words look like and what those words mean in a life. Now look at verse 18. Therefore the Lord longs, remember he says he patiently perseveres to be gracious to you. And guys, remember, this isn't just, grace is not just salvation. Praise God for his grace that's unto salvation, but grace gives us beyond that. Mercy gives us salvation. Grace gives us above and beyond anything we could ask or think in, the, in our eternal reward and in the here and now. And he says, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. So go back to verse 6 of chapter 55. Because I want to point out a couple, one more thing before we move on to our final two points. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Guys, there's a sense of urgency there. Makes sense. While he may be found, while he is near is implying something. There will come a point where he will not be found. There will come a point where he will not be near. And it will be because he's going to come back. And at that point, it's too late. Look at your growth spurt. The growth spurt is the so what of what we've been talking about. It says, are you ready to repent? Which means to turn from your sinful idol of self and come back to God. Are you in a place of soul rest with him through what Jesus has done for you? Is your life a picture of the calm, quiet, peaceful pool that reflects the mighty mountain behind it? Are you trusting him as your all in all rather than going to him as your last resort? Repentance, rest, quietness, trust. Let's beg God together that these words would define our lives, marriages, families, and church individually and collectively as he creates these things in us to put himself on display that others would be drawn to him. I'm going to pray for that right now. Father, I just come to you right now with my brothers and sisters in Christ in this place, and I pray that those words would define us. Lord, I pray that we would find our rest in our repentance, and there, and there we would be strengthened in you. Lord, I pray that we, in our quietness and in our trust, we would, we would demonstrate you to a world that needs to see you. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't feel like we need to do more, because we don't. We can't. We just need to be more. We need to be more in awe of who you are. Lord, make that our reality as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to look at a couple more ways, that, uh, answers that we get out of this passage about why we should look to God. The, first, the fourth way, or the fourth reason is, his wisdom is unfathomable. I can't even say that word, and I wrote it. His wisdom is unfathomable. Look at what he says back in, in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord your God. Declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are on the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Remember, the question we're asking today is why should we look to God? Here's really the reason. He is so... Guys, think about what that's saying. 
He's saying as high as the highest heavens. He's saying, you know, we, we've got the Hubble Space Telescope looking dark, you know, trying to find the edge of the universe. He is saying that as far as the edge of the universe is from your puny little life, so I am, I am greater than that from you. The distance between us is greater than that distance. Guys, the bigger God gets in our minds, the 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 more we see him for who he is. Because he is the God who spoke all of those stars that they're looking at in this huge universe into existence. And he's saying, guys, in fact, in our last study, Job said, look, do you, do you, before, before Job lost his mind and started questioning God too much, he says, look at the heavens. Can anyone explain God? The prophet Jeremiah, who lived 100 years after, after Isaiah did, says this, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things you do not know. Implied in that is there's a whole lot that we don't know that we should go to. Why should we go to God? Because he knows all the things we don't know. That's why. Part of it, though, is where some of us are sitting here, and I've had seasons like this, too, where we're frustrated because we're going, I get that, Doug. I get that, God. But you're not telling me what I don't know. I want to know, and you're not telling me, like, I don't know what to do. We learned in Job, in the series we were in before this one, that God doesn't always tell us. Right? God does not always answer the why question. And we still have to worship him for who he is. Here's the thing. Our God is a sovereign God, and he has revealed himself in his word but there's only so much of his will that he can reveal in his word because, guys, first of all, if he showed it all to us all at once for your own individual life or mine, guys, 10 years ago, if God would have said, Doug, you are going to pastor this church called Cornerstone, I would have been like Jonah. I would have run as far the other direction as I could have gone because I would have felt like, man, I'm not ready. And he'd have been like, I know, Doug, you're not ready. That's why I haven't told you that yet. But once you get there in your life, I will make you ready. But he is sovereign and his plan is unfolding but he has to use terminology that we can understand. And sometimes that leaves us wanting more. The picture I have is, is a trainer and his dog. So we have a gentleman in, this, in our body, Dean McMains, that, has, that, is a dog, that was, I guess, a dog trainer for um, DPS. And he blessed our young, um, young men um, by, t by going out to the Johnson farm and, and, and um, putting a bite suit on Brian Johnson and having him get attacked by his dog. And he, um, but he was talking to the kids about how do you train these dogs? You keep it simple. You give them commands they can understand. You reward obedience. Right? And so we got to watch him. Now, I didn't, this is obviously not him because I, I didn't have a good picture of the dog attacking um, Brian Johnson, but he did. And what was interesting about it is the whole time he's attacking him, the, the dog's tail is wagging. <laughs> and maybe it was just because Brian's so mean. I don't know, but um, just kidding. But, but it's because part of what we learned that night was they train the dog. They, they don't tell him, so here's the deal. He's a bad guy. You need to get him. You need to, you need to we don't use this word in our house, but we need, you need to hate him. So go bite him. They don't do that. They don't say, hey guys, here's the thing. There are bad people in the world that want to blow us up. So you need to go, you, puppy, you need to go search the, the um, Peoria sports complex or whatever for all the bombs that might blow up because that's, they, the dog wouldn't get that. They talk to the dog in terms the dog knows. So, and then they turn it in to a game. Now here's the problem right now. We're sitting here and we're going, wait a second, Doug, you, you're, you're telling me I'm a dog? Because guys, in, this, in, in my analogy, again, it breaks down a little bit. There's a trainer and there's a dog. God is the trainer, we're the dog. And some of you are offended that we're a dog. That's our biggest problem right there. Because here's the deal. Guys, now listen to what I'm about to say. There is, an, there is an infinitely larger difference, an infinitely larger difference between Dean McMain's the dog trainer and God and the dog and me. Do you hear what I just said? I'll say it again because I think I lost you. There is an infinitely greater difference between the trainer and God, in my analogy, than there is between the dog and us. We are closer to the dog than the trainer is to God. Does that make sense? 
So how in the world would God fully reveal his will for your own life or for our church in ways that we could comprehend when he is incomprehensible? So my thoughts are greater than your thoughts. My ways are greater than your ways. He's like, guys, you just, I'm going to talk to you in words you get. But here's the deal. And that's what I love about this picture. I want this picture to burn on your brain. God's the trainer. We're the dog. The dog learns to trust the trainer. He doesn't have to know the whole picture. He doesn't have to know why the trainer's telling him to do that. He just has to ask the question, do I trust him enough to do it? Do I know him well enough to know that I'm, that I'm going to listen to him and take that next step and it's going to be okay? Whether I know why I'm taking, whether, whether, I, whether I know why I'm on those stilts or not, am I willing to take the next step? The only way I am is if I know my God well, so I trust him fully. That's it. So last point. Why should we, why should we look to God? His wisdom is unfathomable and his word is unstoppable. Look at verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear its, and sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And I'm going to stop there for a second, guys. Because right there, there's a picture of the Great Commission. Right there. In that verse, 700 years before Jesus said that we were to go and make disciples, right there it is. How do I know that? Because look what it says. In furnishing seed. Seed is the message of the gospel. In furnishing the gospel message to who? The sower. Who's the sower? You and me. Anybody in Christ. We have the seed implanted. We are to go share it with the world. And then he says, and give bread. That's life-giving nourishment to the eater. Who's the eater? The ones that don't know Jesus Christ. Look at your engagement zone. Engagement zone kind of fleshes that idea out a little bit. It's the now what? So what are we supposed to go do about this? It says, in, the power, in a powerful scene in Scripture, God tells the prophet Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. And if you don't know the story, I'd encourage you to read it, not right now, but in Ezekiel chapter 37. And, says, and the word of the Lord, and at the word of the Lord, the dry bones actually came to life. And then he goes on in that chapter, he says, And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place your, you in your, in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Guys, God is still breathing new life into dry bones. He is still doing it through his word. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ is what Paul tells us in Romans 10. He says, As you engage in the lives of those God has intentionally placed in your path, Trust the power of his word that gives life to the dead and calls into being that which did not exist. Namely, new life in Christ where there once was nothing but death and darkness. So he's saying, guys, if you will just spread the seed of my word, look what happens. Verse 11. So will my word. Guys, I, I, I want to take a second there. and I don't, I'm not doing a word study, but that word, word there... This in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the, is the first or the oldest Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. They, they translated it into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. The, those translators translated that word, word, logos, not rhema. Why does that matter? The rhema is the speak, is the spoken, it's this. It's like, it's this part. Logos is the message of God. He's saying, so, ultimately, here's what he's saying. So it is with my Jesus. How do, whoa, that's a big step. How do I know that? Because in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is the Word for Word in John 1, 1? Logos. Right? And everything came into being, came into being through him, and nothing that has come into being came into being apart from him. But then it says, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But that didn't stop, verse 14. Not this 14 of John 1 and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us so we beheld the glory as the glory of the only begotten of the father that's the word he's describing here turn one more place and we're going to kind of wrap it up with this go to the very beginning of your bible genesis 1 i want to show you the power of the spoken word of god why 
Remember, the question we're asking is why should we seek God? Why should we look to God? Because he is so powerful and his word is so powerful. John 1, verse 3. Well, I'll start in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the... What? Genesis 1, sorry. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. Bam! Look at verse 6. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Look at verse 9. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into place. So he creates land. Verse 11. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. So he creates plants. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse. He creates the suns, the moon. He, he speaks out. Isaiah 40 tells us that he speaks out the stars by name, one by one. In Isaiah 40, verse 26, he talks about that. Look at verse 20. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. So he creates the fish and he ends up creating the birds through the power of his voice. Verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Look at verse 26. This is the beautiful, this is the, the pinnacle of his creation. Here's how he did it. Then God said, let us make man in our own, in our own, in our own image according to our likeness. Guys, okay, so how did God create? How did God bring things to life. He spoke them. Now I'm going to resist the urge to get on my soapbox right now about being in the Word of God every day like I often will do here at Cornerstone because there's going to be great opportunity for that throughout this series because I'm going to kind of leave you hanging a little bit because a lot of this series talks about the importance of being in God's Word. But guys, here's the thing. All, we cannot succeed we cannot know the will of God. We cannot be in His will apart from the Word of God because the Word of God reveals the God of the Word. God spoke and is speaking. On the back table, there's a, 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 um, there's a handout. It looks like this. There's I have plenty of copies back there. I just left them back there for you guys. It is a chapter out of A.W. Tozer's classic, The Pursuit of God, which is a great little book. This is the best chapter in it. It's called The Speaking Voice. I would, I would so encourage you to get this and read it even throughout this series, not just for this message, because it is a powerful reminder that God spoke and he is still speaking. And he does mostly through his word. Okay, sometimes I'll ask, I'll be talking to guys, I meet with a lot of people, I meet with a lot of men, and they're, and they're struggling through, you know, I'm just struggling through what, what is God's will for my life? That's coming up a lot because of the series we're in. First of all, that's fundamentally the wrong question we've learned, right? It's not what is God's will for my life, it is what is God's will? But then I'll, I'll ask them like I often do, so tell me about your time in the Word. I don't really read my Bible very much. Then stop asking. I don't mean stop asking me. I mean stop asking God. Like, I mean, and I, I could not say that more strongly, and if that offends you, you're probably in the wrong church, honestly. Because I so believe, I don't believe it's the only way he speaks. Obviously, the study we're in is going to talk about how he speaks through the Spirit and through ch the church and through life circumstances. But the primary way that he speaks is through the Word of God. And if you are not seeking him and his will in his Word, you're, you're not, it is impossible. And here I am on my soapbox. How did I get there? <sighs> Sorry. Do we come to him in his word expecting to hear from him? That's the question. As we're getting ready to go into communion, that's the question. Do we, we, why do we look to God? Because he is God. Because he is powerful. And because he is right here. And he will speak to us. How does Isaiah end this whole thing? I'm just, it's going to come up on the screen. Look, the last two few verses of the chapter. Look at what happens when we do this. When we seek him. When we look to him. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were th thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtle will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. That's why he does it, to bring himself glory. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. Guys, healthy things grow. And they grow by the power of God. Why should we look to God? Here's why. When we look upon his face more fully, we will see with his eyes more clearly, and we will share his grace more fully. More freely, I'm sorry. I'll read that again. When we look upon his faith, face more fully, we will see his eyes more clearly, and we will share his grace more freely. 
That's why we need to look to him. Let's pray. So Father, I thank you for the truth that you are completely sovereign, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways. Lord, I thank you that I'm a dog, but I have a trainer that I trust. Lord, I pray for those in this room that don't know you as their trainer, that they have not come to trust you, or maybe they have and their trust is wavering. They're afraid to take that next step because they've forgotten how powerful, how all-knowing, how loving you are. Lord, I pray that you would call dry bones to life. I pray that you would fill those of us that have maybe become weary in our walk with the fountain of living water, that we would boldly proclaim, you are our God, look what you've done for us. And that we would remember that ultimately it's to bring yourself glory. Father, I know that, that only, that, that any of this, all of this can only happen when we see you clearly. When we know you fully. When we come to, when we come to, to experience you in a way that is real and genuine and personal. And that's what the cross did. That's what we celebrate now at Communion. When Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and he, and he initiated this, he said, this is the new blood in my, this is the new covenant of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin once for all time. And then he proved that it was true by rising again. And then he sent his spirit as a pledge of our inheritance. So may we look to the cross right now and remember, we don't need to doubt you we don't need to wonder if your plan is going to be fulfilled for my life or for the world. You have left nothing to chance and your son did not die for nothing. Remind us of your steadfast love for us that we might just take the next step with you in Jesus' name. Amen.